Good morning to Joe. Got you on the screen there. How are you today? Incredible, my friend. How are you doing? Doing great. You're coming in nice. Really like the, Come on the now. solid, solid background black. I like it. Your your audio and camera is really nice. So I appreciate you uh, taking that time to make sure everything is solid in advance. Can you please give us a a solid intro like you do on clubhouse because i already got the the energy from you <laughs> give me a solid <laughs> intro a little bit about yourself um and and give us a little little short little history time for where you where you're coming from where you've been a couple little experiences and what you are focusing on today in the marketplace and then we'll go from there yeah perfect well if you want the uh the clubhouse intro i, I can give you yeah. that <laughs> Uh, I, I normally say on Clubhouse, my name is Joe Sugg. I'm the founder of Middle Class Millionaire LLC, where our mission is to educate and empower entrepreneurial minded, faith focused, purpose driven people to achieve financial independence so they can proceed, pursue their God given purpose instead of a life sucking paycheck. I'm also uh, the, the founder of the Kingdom Economy, and that is really where we, we spend most of the time focusing on expanding the kingdom. That, that's really my heart, my passion. I think it's why uh, you and I have connected in, in this way. I, I love what you're doing. And, uh, you know, I'm just excited to be here to see what I can do to help in, in a more casual way. Uh, thanks for having me. And um, I, I really look forward to connecting with you guys. I, I'm a former high net worth financial advisor. And so what that really means is that until 2010, I, I helped people. My minimum client was about a million dollar net worth. My largest client was $750 million. And in doing that, we helped them with all kinds of a range of uh, opportunities. We ran, I ran uh, something as a CEO called a family office. And the family office, basically, if they had any needs at all, uh, whether it was something financial, whether it was something as simple as, hey, I'll, I need you to uh, contact the airport and, uh, and take care of my travel plans, whatever it was, we were expected to, to help them kind of across the board, uh, at least get into the situation, either do it ourselves or more likely we had just the contacts and the connections. And so, you know, I, that's what I did until 2010 uh, and I lost everything. So if you're somebody who has lost everything and is trying to build back or trying to get on your feet, maybe you feel like uh, it can't be done. I can tell you that after losing everything, I, I was back to million dollar status uh, within a, about 12 months. And the reason why is because the, the principles of money are the principles of money. And once you know them, once you understand them, that puts you in position to be able to move forward. So, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to, to talking to you guys, answering any questions and um, hopefully just providing some value to get you to the place you need to be. Thank you for that, Joe. Really appreciate it. And so, Joe, my friend, today I want to dive right into the meat and potatoes. Um, I already got some some quick facts on the board that I always uh, pretty much primarily start with, with my clients. They always have to know their numbers, their four major numbers, income, expense, debt, and cash flow. I typically like to underestimate uh, a client's income. So if they're a hourly type of a, a worker plus commission, I look at their base, like 40 hour work week, anything above that, I consider that extra time and a half. So I, I try to underestimate income. I look at their expenses. I overestimate on expenses, try to create a little buffer, room for error. With debts, I need all the exact numbers, interest rates, monthly minimum payments, and then what they're paying on their on their debts, if they're paying higher, because that could mean cash flow opportunities there. And then leftover net free cash flow, that's after they've saved, tithe, give, um, invested money. I consider all that expenses. If they invest money, that, that's money going away. And then what's left over that true net free cash flow. That's what ideally we want to use to create income opportunities in the marketplace to increase our income. And I've been doing that for the past three years now. Uh, from my angle, Oftentimes, just so you know, Joe, oftentimes people are coming to me because they simply want to uh, eliminate some debt. Either they want to be completely debt free. Um, they're looking to increase their credit score. They're looking to save more money. They want to invest their money a little bit more effectively, which is great. 
and I'll do that through the debt snowball concept, debt avalanche, velocity banking, one step above that, and and infinite banking. The final uh, st strategic move that I like to make is is presenting this this 10x concept, which I get from a very famous guy on YouTube. His name is Grant Cardone. He wrote a book called The 10x Rule, and he goes over how we need to expand our our, our thought process we need to think big if you're making five grand a month we need to think how do we make 50 grand a month not how do i save more money or how do i you know buy more stocks or uh forex or gold and silver like he's more of an expansion type of a guy because he's like well the more capital i have the more of those investments that i can obtain in a, in a shorter time frame to achieve that financial independence financial and freedom that they want now past three years i will dive into these uh, uh that thought process of 10x thinking big trying to create more income streams but i'm not necessarily that qualified to discuss that so i often will kind of just stay in my lane and help people get the structure of their money down first their their personal finances how much are they netting in cash flow how do i increase that cash flow and so over the last six months to a year now, I've been trying to make more content on different alternative, but very practical ways that we can increase income in the marketplace. That doesn't necessarily have to mean quitting your nine to five and doing what the, uh, a lot of these YouTube influencers are, are really marketing at a, at a big scale. And we're talking, you know, Quit your job and do Forex. Uh, quit your job and become a YouTube sensation, a, a, a content creator, Instagram, TikTok star, whatever it is. Not to knock any of that. That's fantastic. It can absolutely work. I'm a result of that. Someone that got fired from their job, started a YouTube channel from scratch in debt with no capital whatsoever, and really grew it to where it's at today, netting over seven figures in in revenue over the three-year time frame from summer of 2018 till today so not, i don't want to knock that because i'm actually a result of that but to let you know the audience that are listening are anywhere between 40s 50s 60s these are people that have careers these are moms dads husbands wives they got families a uh, majority of the listeners are in the u.s so we'll we'll, we'll stick to uh our, our region right here uh, but i do have some canadian listeners very few uk maybe a couple a handful in, in australia so just so you can get an understanding of that so i want to get your take your feedback on how you view when you got a client that comes to you wanting a particular thing whether it's they're, they're, they they want to make more money they want to pay off debt they want to do a, a thousand things what is your process walk us through that process and and why you're taking this unique approach because i gotta be honest with you i talk with i, I collaborate and talk with a lot of people but that two-hour conversation that we had you presented some very unique uh some would even call radical uh strategies to improve a person's finances uh so i want to bring that to my audience today and dive real deep i'm going to take notes and just kind of let you do most of the talking. So I gave you a nice little background of kind of how I operate, where I'm at, and the the type of audience. And now I want to give you the floor to just hammer away at this while I take notes because I'm going to be learning. And for the 27 people watching at the moment, they're going to be learning a lot as well. So I just want to give you that. Sounds good. Uh, you know, here's what I'd like to do. As I'm going to go ahead and jump into a few things here, just based on what you just said. But if uh, you're watching and you're in the audience right now and you're uh, you're a viewer that has questions you have you're a viewer who has a specific circumstance that you would love for me to address or love for Denzel to address um, a, a type of and it doesn't have to be any details but if you have something that you're specifically dealing with or uh, that is coming up or how do I think through this process you ask how how I approach things Denzel and you you and I have had some good conversations. And, you know, one of the things that I find is that different people, 
they respond based on their perspective, their perception. And you've heard it said that perception is reality. And the reality is that perception may be your reality, but it doesn't mean it is reality. And, and so what happens is we have different people that have been taught different systems and different processes depending on their, their background and their uh, socioeconomical status. And so, and just to be clear, this has nothing to do with uh, anything other than just how much money you have made and where you're at in the socioeconomic process. And so typically uh, people who have, uh, are, are in what we'll call poverty and poverty is, is kind of a funny thing because it could be something not necessarily uh, the way you would think of it. It, it could be somebody, I, I had a client that came to me that was making $250,000 a year, but their expenses were $275,000 a year. And so they were in poverty, even though they were living a lavish lifestyle, they were still broke. And that's really all that means is they were broke. And then you have the middle class, the people who are, are kind of getting along and they've got a little bit money, money to save and maybe they're uh, less than a, a million dollar net worth. And you know, that's kind of what they would consider middle class. And you know, for me, when I think of middle class, I think uh, what I refer to as the middle class millionaire, somebody in the one to $5 million net worth range. And you know, the reason I call it middle class millionaire is because if you break it down, and you say, how much am I actually going to have? And you may use the word retirement. I use financial independence. Uh, if, if I'm going to uh, get to that place of freedom, whatever you want to call it, then you know what number does that have to be for me? And that number is typically uh, for a middle class income, somewhere between one and five million if you're investing traditionally. And so you know, we could talk about advanced things if you wanted to. But when you start looking at specifics, I go through a five-step process. The first process, first step is that I want people to expand income. I want them to increase income. And the reason why I want them to increase income is because if you're looking at your balance sheet, then you've got income and expenses, right? That's what Denzel just showed us. We've got our income, we've got our expenses, but there's two ways to address that challenge. And most of the time when you're looking at eliminating debt, then you're looking at a, a way to uh, pay down your expenses. And so people are trying to get as light as they can possibly get. And that's not how wealthy people approach things. In fact, the reason they're wealthy is because they understand momentum. They understand momentum of money and they understand compound interest. They understand compounding the impact of what they're doing. And if you're constantly focusing on the bottom line, then that's all you're going to do. That's the, in a business, if I was going in and I was going to uh, try and increase the valuation of a business quickly, and I wanted to, they were going to sell. Then the first thing you do is you go in and you trim all the fat because then that helps you in a multiple situation. Every dollar that you can save gives you immediate impact to your valuation. So a lot of times when people are teaching that, that principle of getting light, getting light, getting light, the, the piece that are missing is that your debt in most instances is a symptom of not enough income. And so, you know, we go, well, Joe, I've got a job and there's only so much I can do. Well, I understand that. I think we're going to get into that some today, but when you look at things from an income perspective, really there's four ways to make income four ways to make income. And, you know, if you want to do this simply, you could just kind of create a, a little cross, you know, like a, uh, a, li a little quadrant. Yeah. And in the top left-hand corner of that quadrant, I want you to write, get a job. In the bottom left-hand corner of that, I want you to write, own a job. In the top right-hand corner of that, I want you to write, create a job. And in the bottom right-hand corner, I want you to write, build a portfolio. Those are the four ways to create income. And so what happens too many times is people start with get a job and that's great. If that's where you're at, perfect. In fact, you know, Denzel and I were talking about this before we came on live and you know, I, I'm, I'm with him. You know, if you look at that and you say, um, if, 
if you've got a job, don't quit your job before you have enough income to where it makes sense. Now, some of you are in a position to where you maybe had to let go of your job. You know, there, I saw a number the other day, yesterday, I believe that 4 million people have resigned from their jobs over all of this vaccine mandate. Now, I don't care where you stand on it one way or the other, but that's a reality of something going on in the economy right now. And a lot of those people are having to try and figure out how to replace an income. Well, they're in a different position than somebody who is currently stable in their job. So if you're not stable right now, then you've just got to hustle and get to where you want to be. Now, that's where people kind of mix things up a little bit. You see what they do is they say, well, I'm looking for a side hustle where I'm looking for a hustle that I can get after. So they look at things like I'm going to drive Uber. I'm going to go out and um, I'm going to do things that cause, cause you have to use your time. I'm going to get a network marketing deal and I'm going to go out and I'm going to network market. Now, can network marketing be a positive thing? I can tell you I have really good friends that make six, seven figures in network marketing. I could never do it. Why? Because I don't like the, the, the products most of the time. And so there's a lot of people that get into these things where you say, okay, what am I going to focus on? And if you're focusing on things that are taking your time, then all you've done is you've gone from have a job to own a job. And there's some opportunities in that from the standpoint that you have flexibility, but you also have some stresses. And so make sure that you're not jumping out of the, the frying pan and into the, <laughs> or out of the fire into the frying pan, right? You don't want to get out of one place into the next. So really you want to focus on opportunities that are going to allow you to leverage your time and leverage money. Those are the ways that you build. And those are the ways you grow and that's how you expand. Awesome. What you so think, Denzel? Was, that's good. So that was first things first. Number yep. one, you have of your five step process. Number one, expand income. And there's four ways to ultimately do that. Yep. You get get a job. And when I have the job, I can rank up that job, promotions, bonuses, incentives. I can make to manager, regional manager, executive director. I can go up the corporate ladder or I hate my job or I don't like my job or in a situation like today, more relevant, I'm being mandated to do something that I don't want to do. I, I literally had a call with a, a, a nurse a couple months, maybe two months ago. She's like, look, I, um, She's got a, a little over 300,000 in her, I think a, a, some kind of pension or retirement fund. And she's like, come November, or October, this was both, we're in November now, but around end of October, she was like, if they say that I have to take this vaccine, then that's gonna be an early retirement for me. I'm gonna have to just withdraw the funds and I have to figure out a, a new opportunity to get into she's like problem is I've, I've been doing this my whole life nursing so um you know we're having conversations back and forth so you may be in that type of situation and then you go to the own a job where you find some type of opportunity now just to clarify owning a job could mean like joining a, a network marketing or an mlm correct something like that it could be that it could be construction okay. it could be uh going out and uh opening a maid service it could go out you could go out and create a, a, seal, a deal where you're uh, doing a landscaping company. You could go out and you could create a uh, anything self-employment that requires you right. to use your time. Right. And it's and you're trading time for money. Now you mm -hmm. get to keep all of it. Yeah. You get to keep all of it that you make, but there's other other challenges. And we could dig deep into that, right? You know, you yeah. could talk about all the expenses, all the things that are there. Right. But, so, so but the reality majority is... is Got it. So majority is like sales and, and marketing is, is owning a job. Um, and then the other two is create a job and even being an insurance sales. agent, even right. being a financial advisor, Definitely. that would be a, an example of that as well. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So got that part. Um, creating a job, building a portfolio. You, you, you stepped into that a little bit, but I want you to go through your, your five-step process. So yep. what's number two? Uh, number two is that you're going to, um, increase assets. So, you know, if you're increasing your income, what most people have been taught to do or believe they should do is they feel here's the, here's the cycle, right? Denzel, people get uh, focused on their need. 
they get focused on their lack. And that's one of the real issues I have with um, the idea and the, the principles that are taught a lot of times that we need to focus initially on debt elimination. Because what happens is, I'm, I'm a certified John Maxwell leadership coach, um, coach, trainer, speaker. Um, I, I get mentored by uh, by Mr. Maxwell and um, he, he calls us his friend. And, um, and so when you start looking at what he says, it's pretty interesting. He says, anything that we focus on expands. Anything we focus on expands. And so if we're focusing on nothing but debt elimination, the problem is we're, we're just drilling, 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 and then life happens. And what happens is it puts us in this cycle to where we feel like we're doing everything that we've been taught to do, yet we're just running up against this wall over and over and over again. And that's the problem, is that we're in a place where unfortunately, people get there. So then if what's the right way, the right way is to then increase your income, whether it's side hustles, whether it's a side business, you know, I, I would tell you, there's a few things that I tell people to focus on affiliate marketing, leveraging your knowledge, AKA be a coach, be a, a guru, be whatever it is, leverage your knowledge. And then the third thing is uh, leveraging other people's money. And so I, I teach people how to leverage assets that increase their opportunities. So when you look at um, the when you look at the uh, expanding assets, well, now if you've increased your income, the first thing you have to do is you have to then take that income and gather assets. When I was um, a financial advisor. I kind of fell backwards into being a financial advisor. I, I'm married. I, I believe you are too, aren't you, Denzel? I am not married yet. It's, it's not married. It's coming soon. <laughs> Come on, brother. <laughs> I uh, I got married late. I was thirty, right around thirty, I guess. That's about when I, I want to get married. <laughs> and uh, it it was a good time, honestly. Um, I've got buddies of mine that now their kids are. Uh, going into college and everything else, but uh, it's, it's been a good opportunity for me to go to school on them. And so they, uh, I got married at 30 years old in 2005. And in 2005, my wife to be came to me and she said, you know, Joe, I know that you're in real estate. I did a lot of real estate and still do. I'm a big fan of real estate. We can talk about real estate for a long time. But when we look at real estate, she said, I know you make money. I just don't know how it works. And I said, well, that's a good question. Let me talk about it. So here's how it works. You see, I go and I find a house and I buy the house and I turn around, and I sell the house and I get paid when I, I sell the house. It's really that simple. And she said, okay, that makes sense. So how much do you make when you sell a house? And I said, well, it varies depending on the house, but um, you know, it, it can be all over the place. And she said, well, when was the last one you did? I said, well, last month. And she said, well, how much money did you make on that one? I said, $10,000. And she went, hmm, that's pretty good. And I said, yeah, I, I wasn't bad. She said, so when's the next one? Um, I, I don't know. Well, where does it come from? Well, you know, I just go out and I just talk to people and eventually they come and you know, when they come then I get, get paid a lot of money and it normally takes me to the next one. And she said, well, is there a way we can be a little bit more stable? <laughs> can we be a little more consistent? Mm. And that's how I ended up as a financial advisor. I, I sat there and said, well, you know, I'm already given a lot of advice and guiding people. And what I learned as a financial advisor was this. They said, all right, Joe, here's how we're going to do this. I'm going to teach you how to retire. It made sense to me, right? I'm going to teach people how to retire. So they're teaching me how to retire in my training. And they went on to tell me how to retire. And I said, well, how do cl clients retire? They said, well, the, the clients, they, we just put them in a mutual fund. We build up their assets and you know, if they save enough, then they'll get to where they want to go. But that's really on them. That's not on you. And I said, well, what happens if their portfolio goes down? And he says, well, that's not a, that's not really your issue. You still get paid. I said, well, right. I, I, I don't know that I like that model. So what was the model he told me of how to retire? What he told me is I need to go out and gather assets. 
And that's what the second model is, gather assets. You see, you go out and you gather assets as many as you can find, wherever you can find them. Now, what are those assets? I use a lot of real estate personally, but that's not the only asset you can, can gather. It can be things like gold. It can be things I typically prefer the majority of assets gathered to be hard assets. I know there's a lot of crypto talk out there. I know there's a lot of those types of things. Um, I prefer something that is solid um, and less volatile for stabilizing uh, your future. And so you can play in some of these other markets. And I know guys who are really good at them, but you know, when you're looking at building stable, stable futures, I want something that is stable as well. And so I want hard assets. I want real estate. Uh, I want gold. Um, I want commodities. I want things that are tangible. Then I can go beyond that into other, other areas. I like, uh, as a, a piece of that equation, I like insurance. I think there's a lot of ways to leverage the insurance component. And we could talk about that for a long time as well, Denzel. But when you start looking at those pieces, you've got to gather assets and other assets you can do is you can leverage other people's time. The way you do that is it sounds kind of counterintuitive. You see a lot of people say, well, you know, you're taking advantage of people. Listen, a lot of guys out there are looking for people to help them market their solutions. Look at Amazon. Amazon has an affiliate program. So a lot of guys get on YouTube and everything else and they pump a, a specific product. That's an affiliate program, but you can do bigger affiliate programs. So you can find coaches, you can find other people out there that are willing to give anywhere from 10% to I've got some affiliate agreements personally that are up to 75% of what the cost of the, the deal is. So why do they pay me that? Well, because they have an acquisition cost either way. And so if you get into the place where you understand how to position yourself properly, then now you are creating yourself as a market maker. And that's really how you begin to really expand those assets, which then create additional income streams. And then that just compounds it. So that's when you start talking about velocity banking, that's where you can really ramp up that velocity of money, which is really an economic principle. I don't know if you guys knew that, but velocity of money is just a typical standard economics 101 uh, principle for, for general macro economics, economics. Love it. Okay. So we got just to recap here on the board, we've got OPM, other people's money in terms of increasing how to increase assets and income. I can leverage other people's money and in some way on, on my channel, we're doing a version of that, but in the, in the debt world, what your, your angle is saying, you know, maybe debt's not the most important thing we can go after in terms of expanding income, increasing assets. You're talking about leveraging other people's money, other people's time, other people's businesses through referral marketing, affiliate marketing, and then leveraging your knowledge about other people's money, other people's time, referral marketing, affiliate marketing to create this velocity of money, this momentum effect, which I, I really like. And this is something that I want to be able to uh, bring on my channel a little bit more so that people can see that other angle. Because the, the truth of the matter is that was my approach when I got fired at my job back in 2018 prior to that i was doing side hustles i was getting involved in and out of network marketing companies i was selling invicta watches i was you know uh i did an internship for a janitorial service company i was networking i was i was in a lot of sales and marketing opportunities where it was you know trading time for money so in addition to the main job i was doing the sales and marketing so I was going from having a job and owning another job that I was responsible of the time, the scheduling, the follow up, the emails, the, the communication, the paying for the lunches, the dinners, the breakfasts to meet these people. And then it wasn't until I started the YouTube channel where I started leveraging other people's time and other people's businesses and I got heavily involved 
in the affiliate and referral marketing and just a quick example is a relationship that I have with an insurance industry where they have a particular goal to get to a hundred million dollar valuation by 2030 by me getting involved with them in 2018 to date that's generated over 310 or 315 thousand dollars in, in revenue to date so if, and and that has been a 30 to 35 percent increase in income year over year by simply leveraging their knowledge leveraging their uh organization their training their products and services their marketing their everything very low uh capital requirement on my time very low time effort on on my end as well and just by doing the math if all i did was increase year over year by 15 percent by 2030 i would make over a half a million dollars in the year 2030 and then i was doing the numbers over that whole nine year period from 2021 to 2030 that's over 3.3 million dollars in revenue of a hundred million dollar organization so that i'm i'm getting two to five percent of their hundred million dollars that's not a bad deal at all by doing what you're talking about and for for me being able to explain that a little tough so i i don't, I don't really know how to explain it but now i have someone like you and i appreciate the audience in the comments like drop your questions let us know if we're on the right track here if it's landing so far um or if you need us to kind of go back and re repeat something over i'll monitor those comments so with that expand income number one i can do that via creating a getting a job owning a job creating a job building a portfolio number two is increasing assets that has to do with other people's money other people's time uh, leveraging knowledge leveraging uh, a lot of it from what i'm hearing is leveraging because there's only 24 hours in a day so you have to leverage it's not a matter of not wanting to or i'm afraid to it's it's how do i get over that fear or doubt or whatever that has to do with leveraging uh from what i was taught about money and now you're approaching it from this angle what's number three moving forward all right so when you look at things it's increase income ex uh, gather assets now, gather assets is a key component. It's not just increasing assets, it's gathering assets. And so, you know, obviously there's a lot of ways to do that. And people say, the first typical response I get, Denzel, is, well, I can only gather so much. I don't have a lot of assets. I'm not, an, I'm not a wealthy person like you. I'm not a wealthy person that, that does things. Uh, Greensboro. Okay. I, I've got a good buddy of mine, Edward Jones in Texas. So uh, that's, I just didn't know if, if it was the same guy, if I happened to, to, to jump into a room here that, uh, that Edward happened to be in. Um, when, when you looked at uh, gathering assets, there's lots of ways to do that. And they don't always um, require you to A, own the asset and B, purchase the asset with all of your own resources. And so what people traditionally do is even in real estate, you know, when you and I started talking about real estate, you said, well, I'm trying to get in position to, to you know, get more rental properties and get, get more, um, more real estate. Well, when you start doing that, the challenge that most people run into is, well, I've got to get my credit right. I've got to have enough for the down payment. I have to have all these different things. And really what you need to understand is that if you invest in understanding the process and understanding how the transactions work, then now you're in a position to be able to control the process. And in the meantime, you can wrap those assets. And that's number three, you wrap the assets. So you gather assets and then you wrap those assets. So why do you wrap assets? Well, once again, going back to when I got into financial services, and I'm not just for the record, I am not a financial advisor. I'm not here to give you any investment advice. Um, I'm, I'm just a guy that happens to have a lot of experience uh, in both making a lot of money and uh, and seeing everything completely crash down. Mm -hmm. I, I have ha fought many battles and those of you who may have heard my testimony uh, may know uh, some of the other elements of things that, you know, I think many of us are, are of faith and right now people are of faith 
are under attack. And, you know, I truly believe that that is why God has called me to be in this position today, because in 2019, he came to me and I was talking to my pastor and he said, he and felt like God impressed on my heart that there was about to be a lot of hurting people that needed to get in position, but that he was looking to expand their world, expand their their opportunities in the midst of crisis. Very similar to the, the children of, of Israel when they were in the midst of the famine and Joseph came in and he was able to, to build up the storehouses for seven years. And then there was seven years of famine. But in those seven years of famine, while everybody in the kingdom really, except for, for Pharaoh, lost everything, right? I mean, if you go back and read the story, they all lost everything. But the children of Israel actually were blessed tremendously in the midst of famine. And I believe that if the people of God will put their fears aside and step into true principles and start gathering assets, there is an opportunity right now to really expand the kingdom like we've never had before. Now in 2019, I didn't know that that was coming. I just felt like it was coming and it made no sense. My pastor told me, he's like, Joe, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. I'm serious enough that I'm liquidating and I'm putting putting things in place and uh, and getting in position. And I completely changed my entire business model uh, to to make sure that I got in position to help you guys, people like you. And the reality is this: we are in the midst of the greatest wealth transfer in the history of the world, and we've got to learn how to increase income, expand our assets, gather assets, wrap those assets, and then number four, repeat. You see, it's not all about all or nothing. It's about taking things step by step and I'm going to get myself in trouble, Denzel, but I'm not talking about baby steps. Mm -hmm. Baby steps are going to get you killed. I'm talking about taking step by step moving forward. You see, you've got to step into your purpose, your potential, your opportunity, because now is the time. I'm going to give you a bonus deal that I, I normally only give to, to my mentorship group. In the middle of gathering assets and building income, increasing income, you've got to do what's called creating firewalls, create firewalls. And so what I teach is that as you're gathering assets, you get into a place where you've got your income level established. Your income then increases, but you keep your lifestyle where you're at. As your income increases and you gather assets, your assets that you gather are going to begin kicking off income as well. And that's going to provide you stability. But you don't increase your lifestyle until your income is stabilized. Because what that does is it creates a firewall. And then you create a separate component that allows you to, to move forward. You see, uh, Denzel, you talked a second ago about uh, uh, Grant Cardone. Grant Cardone. Now, you've probably picked up already that I've been around people who are broke and I've been around people who are extremely wealthy. Absolutely. And when, when you're around people who are extremely wealthy, there are two types of people. You have guys, they're, they're typically, the majority of them are hard drivers. Some of them, I would call them what basically blowhards. And you have to learn how to deal with that kind of personality when you get into that, that realm. But there are two types of ways when you start talking about leverage. There are people who say you should never use leverage ever under any circumstance, right? The economy is built on leverage, the entire economy, how money works is based on leverage. And so here's a fact. You are either using leverage or you are being leveraged. There's really no in between. I love you too much to tell you anything. Otherwise the exact opposite spectrum is what I would call the Grant Cardone spectrum. And that is, you leverage, 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 leverage until you are max leverage to the hilt. And the problem with that is that leverage is a two, two edged sword. You see, it cuts both ways quickly. And if you're not putting yourself in position with firewalls to prevent you from losing everything when the tide turns, then you're going to find yourself in the same cycle, regardless of which way you go. You've got to be in a balanced perspective in the middle. You've got to find the balanced way to move forward in a, a, a greater way than you ever possibly thought possible before, 
while simultaneously putting things in place. I'll tell you this, I can, past performance is not indicative of future results. <laughs> right. But I can tell you that many of the strategies that I personally use to gather assets allow me to purchase properties. And, you know, Denzel and I laughed about this uh, in our call with no money down. Now, that doesn't mean that that's a real thing, no money down. I had to spend a lot of money to get to the place to where I got the transaction. The transaction itself didn't cost me any money, but so many times people are not put in position properly to get there. So that's why you need to increase your income. You've got to put yourself in position where you got that little bit of seed, but you don't, what people, Christians, can I talk to Christians for a second, Denzel? Please, because for the most part, you're dealing with a lot of kingdom citizens that are, are of the kingdom, believe the faith. So there's an overwhelming majority that are leaning on that side and very few are in between. And then I have a couple of very, very few um, non-believers, but I got to tell you, sometimes those are some of the easiest, easiest people to talk to because I agree logic. hundred so. percent. So non-believers, you're probably going to be jumping in your seats right now. <laughs> Go ahead. Believers. Here's what we've been taught. We've been taught by a bunch of broken people, broken theology that perpetuates broken results and continues to create broken people in a broke economy. We call the, the kingdom economy. So what do I mean by that? So many times we've been taught whether it's openly or whether it's just in principle, things that are not necessarily in context scripturally. And I'm not going to go deep into this. The reality is this. Too many times we've been taught that if we increase income above what we have or above what we need, that's excess. And the reality is that's not excess. <laughs> We're still broke. My friends, did you know legally, did you know legally if you have a less than a $50,000 net worth, in many instances, by law, you are considered bankrupt. Wow. Do you know that? I did not. I didn't either. Where, where can we read that? Where can we find that? Bankruptcy law. You can just go to the bankruptcy law and look it up. But I, I was told that by an attorney. Wow, okay. So I didn't make it up. The, the attorney told me. Mm -hmm. And the reason the attorney told me is because I had somebody, it was from an asset protection standpoint, somebody was coming and trying to get to my assets and they said, you need to file bankruptcy. And I said, but I'm not bankrupt. They said, well, I know you've got all these other things in different places, but what you actually have is less than $50,000. And so you're bankrupt. Now, whether you file for protection or not, doesn't really matter. Hmm. Did you talking catch about, that? Talking about personal net worth, regardless of assets and other, you know, like, umbrellas or, or corporations the attorney was telling you personal network, personal under yep. 50k yep you need so, to file bankruptcy because they were coming up to he you. wasn't necessarily saying you need to and for me it was i was trying to protect here's the kicker for me it was more than fifty thousand dollars i was trying to protect over a hundred thousand dollars in this one transaction now it was an entity so you know, it was something that was there, but the point to this is, I don't wanna to get too deep into that because that's a whole nother conversation. But when you look at things from a perspective of, so many people are allergic to looking at all the options. Agreed. And when we don't look at all the options, then we sometimes may be sitting there going, well, we're playing by rules that don't exist anymore. You see, if you continue to play by the rules that your grandparents and your great grandparents uh, played by, you're going to fail where they succeeded because the rules have changed. Mm. Second thing. So people are allergic to income because they, they constantly feel like, well, I've got excess. And so because they feel like that they have excess, then they have a fatal flaw with the second point. They give when they should gather. Oh, that's deep and very dangerous. I like where you go. I like where you're going. They give when they should gather. Mm. I'll go back to the story of Joseph. He had excess that came in for seven years and he put it in a storehouse that not only sustained him, but allowed him to sustain the entire kingdom. Now, I'm gonna give you one more step in that. Have you ever gone back and read and recognized that Joseph didn't give away the food mm. when everybody needed it? He had saved it, he had put it in, he didn't give it away. When, when, when it initially came in. Well, after, 
after it came in. Gotcha. In right. the famine. During the famine. During the famine. So what have we been taught? Well, We've been taught that, well, God has blessed me with this so that I can bless others. Mm -hmm. And what happens is we need to recognize that God has put us as stewards over his resources. We don't own any of it. And when we recognize that we don't own any of it, then we can recognize that the only time that we deploy our resources is when it is in line with what God has told us to do for his purpose in our lives. So I know you mentioned wow. that people seed into your your financial ministry and helping uh, help, helping women uh, achieve their their purposes and get get to where they need to get to. Yeah. It's it's one component in in what I've right. been building, right? So, when people seed into your ministry, they're not seeding to get. That's not biblical. They're coming in alignment and partnership with the purpose of what that is designed to do. I can't plant apple seeds at your house and expect oranges to show up on my porch. Right. That's not natural. That's not even supernatural. It's not how God created it. Mm -hmm. And so, so many times we have been taught you can't outgive God. And I'll tell you, that's not biblical. Because what happens is too many times we get the seed and we either give it away or we eat it. And I'll leave that there. Mm. Too deep? It's 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 very deep. I don't think the audience was expecting it. And like you were saying, the, the, the non-believer crowd, the people that are somewhat not so in that direction are, are saying, no wonder. You know, they're like, what? it just doesn't make sense what's being preached versus what's actually going down versus what actually can be and if it was if it could just be explained this way if i could just not have this um this fear like god's gonna get me if i don't tithe or god's gonna god's gonna curse me because i didn't give um my ten dollars uh at at service at mass when i had a hundred in my pocket i didn't give ten um these are are fundamentals in the four major numbers of everyone's personal finances that could be tweaked to also expand income. I would I would definitely argue and I think you would agree like there are certain things that a lot of us Christians are doing to destroy our finances before we even get the four or five step process that you're sharing. Am, am I on the right uh, kind of pathway here? I think that's kind of like 100%. Okay. Yep. 100%. Yeah. I, I would love to go a little deeper because I know my audience can handle it um, when I drop it on them like this. I know they can handle it. And I think there are some critical uh, formulas or, or traditional things that we're doing with money that if we could just tweak it, whether it be permanently or temporarily for a period of time to adjust our ability or increase our likelihood to expand on income to start that four step process that uh, five step process that you're going over so i, I want to give it back to you in terms of how you want to keep moving this way i know there's a there's a step five to your five process i don't know if you want to wrap it up there or take it another level deeper where you just went because <laughs> i yeah, think some I, people just said oh oh yeah I, I think that you know really i i, I simplified it for you to four steps okay four okay got it so i i just i simplified it down to four because uh you know, I, I, I sometimes believe in the keep it simple, stupid model when mm -hmm. I can remind myself, um, listen, we're talking about income. That's the, the core of today's talk. And so, you know, if you guys have specific questions or whatever, we can go in all kinds of different directions. But, and I'm, is this adding value, Denzel? I, I just want to add value. I just want to give these people something that will help them get them someplace they want to go. But if I'm not adding value, I don't need to hear myself talk. I, so far, I've been receiving a, a, a ton of value. I think you're scratching the the surface and I, I really want to go a little bit deeper in terms of, okay, once I have the process, once I yep. have the steps, got it, Joe. Okay. Let's, let's give an example. I, I've got quite a few clients that have eliminated their highest interest debts and the only thing they have remaining is a two, 3% 30 year mortgage and student loans that are on deferment, not charging them any interest at the moment. 
they're cash flowing 1500 2000 3000 4000 a month and they're wondering what their next move should be they're they're thinking hmm should i start an infinite banking policy now or should i should i start saving money alternatively in this direction should i should i buy cryptos joe should i do you know all these other wild things that are rolling around the internet or is there a way for me to expand back into the the income that i already have like how do i redirect cash flow back to the income column and you broke it down into those four different ways can we can we go into that um once they've got the steps and they're in a good financial position but they're a little bit on the fence they're like you know i got this four or five thousand extra uh, cash flow sitting around i've got a little emergency fund built i have a couple of firewalls maybe they got some term maybe they got some permanent um they've got a couple you know their their house is protected they they've refinanced their mortgage to the super low rate super low payment they've redirected cash flow their cars are paid off i'm dealing with a lot of clients at the moment where i've been helping them with their debts get rid of the credit cards and the high car loans and the and high personal loans with lending club and lending tree and all that and they're at this moment where they're like oh yeah i got some excess i got some free cash flow and they're like denzel i need that policy right away i'm like well, hold on you're making six seven thousand a month and you're cash flowing three that's really awesome how do we go from seven to 14 seven to 21 seven to seventy thousand that's that's not going to happen through ibc through cash value life insurance that's not going to happen through uh crypto necessarily um that's not going to happen through stocks overnight that's not going to happen so I, I i know you're you're getting on something uh, so expand on that please please that's where i think the the ultimate value is going to come out of this so if somebody came to me in the situation that you just described then i'd probably have some follow-up questions okay let's roll okay play. let's role play perfect here's what i would ask you let's go back to the mortgage because i think this is one of the things that is really misunderstood especially in the realm of people who are trying to get debt free um i had a buddy of mine he's a, a pilot for he used to be uh jesse duplantis's private pilot i don't know if you knew who that is he's a yeah uh, he's a televangelist yeah, um, yeah, yeah. and uh you know the dude's hilarious i now, know i know you know you, you can can say whatever you want about whether you agree with him or disagree with him theologically but he's funny you know and um uh, you know he even the times that i've met him personally because of my buddy Dave, he, um, <laughs> it, he, he's just, he's funny. He, he just tells some stories and you're going, it, it's like, you know, hanging out with a, a stand up comedian all the time. <laughs> with that said, Dave had a very, um, traditional thinking in that he wanted to save all of his money and pay cash for his house. That was his, that was his dream. And he knew I was in real estate and I'm buying houses and doing all kinds of stuff. And he's still saving up money to buy his house. And I said, Dave, you can't outrun it. He said, can't outrun what? I said, inflation. He said, what do you mean? Well, this was back then. I'll give you today's numbers. Today's numbers is that inflation is sitting somewhere between six and six and a half percent. Insane. Six and six and a half percent. Now, Here's the, the crazy part. That number does not factor in food or gas. Do you know that, Denzel? It's not factor in food or gas, which is a major expense amongst all households. So year over year, 50% increase in both. Wow. In the last uh, year, two years. 12 months. 12 months. Gotcha. So we're feeling this impact of expenses that are going out, but it's, it's a, a, it's felt but it's not told to us. It's sort of like a lot of times people are talking about, um, they're talking about unemployment rates, but you have to understand one of the things I learned many years ago in college, which by the way, I didn't tell anybody this, but it, it probably makes sense since I'm busting out with um, some of this Bible stuff. I, I'm a former pastor as well. I, I was a pastor until 2001. And so I, I've gone to Bible college um, and studied and uh, I'm, I'm probably a little bit further along than um, your average coach. But with that said, when I was in college, I took an economics course. 
And one of the things they taught was statistics. And statistics, they said, here's the thing about statistics. Statistics is the art of making numbers say anything that you want them to say. Wow. So when people tell you it's a percentage, a percentage of this, it's increased by this percentage, it's downcreased by this percentage, based on what? It, it, you can take the equation and you can move the variables around and depending on what's there, you can make it say anything you want it to say. Right. That's why people say 98% of statistics are made up, hmm. which that probably is made up too, because nobody really knows. You see, when you're talking about all these things, it really creates a problem. So back to inflation. If you have an, a mortgage right now at two, 3%, here's what I would ask you, Denzel. If you pay that down for every dollar that you put in to that, I'll go, give you a little quotation marks, that in, if you can create that investment, how much money are you saving? And most for every people- dollar, Every dollar you put into your, no. your house, to pay down your your mortgage what are you making on that money how much is that money making you right M most people cannot answer that um so i'm gonna take a guess just for example here if i'm making extra if you know the number give it to me you know okay cool if i'm making extra payments via yep. my net cash flow onto my mortgage that saves me say roughly three to four dollars in interest for every dollar i put in in principle let's let's call it that or something like that because they they're looking at the fact that okay it's a it's a three hundred thousand dollar four hundred thousand dollar mortgage over 30 years i'm gonna pay two times that you know six hundred thousand or whatever the case may be right so these are definitely example not let's just use a hundred thousand dollar house okay let's do that so i got a hundred k mortgage okay. and uh rates are super low so can i do say 2.5 percent whatever you want to do all right yeah because that's realistic right now okay and two five two point five percent is that a 15 year mortgage uh let's let's do uh 30. Or is that a 30 year mortgage yeah let's do 30. okay so let's say that your payment on that is what 500 bucks a month piti okay okay so that is obviously going to get broken down as a portion of that's going towards principal part portion of that's going towards interest part portion of that is going towards taxes and insurance. Now we're taught that that mortgage is going to cost us a lot of money over those 30 years, right? Yes. Because we're paying interest on $100,000 for 30 years. That's that's expensive. So we need to pay it down as quickly as possible. So for every dollar that we put in there, let's say that we owe $60,000 because we've been making aggressive payments. So we would write 60,000 under the hundred. Okay. So the question is, how much are we making on the $40,000 that we paid down? Right. How much does equity cost or equity make us formulate that for me? How do we, how do we make sense of that? How do we calculate okay. that? So if you have $40,000 in there, most people would say that it is making us the 2.5%, right? They say that it's, well, it's making me 2.5%. No. It's potentially saving you 2.5%, but every dollar you deploy, regardless of where you deploy it, has one of two expenses. It either has an opportunity expense, right? These two side by side, opportunity expense. Right below the 60, is that good? Yep. Okay. And then next to it, right, um, call it a, a deployment expense or opportunity expense or, um, yeah, that's fine, deployment expense. Okay. So your deployment expense, if you were to use that $40,000 there was 2.5% or was, was what it was that we deployed that money to save 2.5%. So write 2.5% underneath there under, under deploy. Okay. Save 2.5%. Yeah. We've saved 2.5%. Yeah. So just write two. So we're making technically in our minds, we're making 2.5%. Okay. Right. So if I'm not paying it, then, then I, I'm keeping it. That's that's the mindset. Right. Now, this what did we just de say? Deploy what means did, this is me paying into the mortgage. Correct. Got so it. So every time I every time I, I spend an extra dollar, every time I make an extra payment, every time I make bi-monthly payments, every time I make um, a 
extra payment on a 15 year mortgage instead of a 30 year mortgage. Every time that I put extra money that is going into the principal, then I am buying down my equity. And every time I'm buying down that equity, then I'm saving myself whatever the cost of the, of the interest is, right? Yep. That's the okay. uh, mindset. Sure. So let's keep going. Now, the question is, what am I actually making on equity? So that actual, the, you know, I'm saving 2.5%, but does equity make any difference in the valuation of the piece of real estate? The answer is no. You see, if I have a hundred thousand dollar house and it appreciates to $150,000, did that have anything to do with the amount of equity that I had in the house? No, no. So it actually didn't make us anything. So if it's not making us anything and it's actually just going into the mortgage, then the question is, well, I'm saving 2.5%, but what am I also doing? I'm also losing the opportunity to make more. And I'm also incurring another expense. Ah, What's the expense I'm incurring? The fact that I'm uh, inflation. Okay. I was going to say cash flow. Yep. Well, that too, but we'll get there in a minute. Okay. So cat, so inflation. So if I'm making AKA saving 2.5%, however, I am losing and I'll Four. go conservatively 6%. So put minus 6% underneath our deployment expense. Got it. Then my net is that every time I put a dollar into my mortgage, I'm losing 3.5% every year. Mm. And this is, this is what I've been working on trying to make sense of when I am talking to my, my clients that have approached that stage where all they have left is the mortgage. Cause I'm, I'll, I'll, I'm all in, in favor of wiping out high interest debt with high pay, monthly payments, which could redirect so much cash flow to position us better without a doubt. And it also releases stress. But then I get to this point, the mortgage or a, a high student loan debt, we're talking multiple six figures. And the concept of velocity banking only makes sense for a very short period of time and, and um, or debt snowball, debt, debt, debt acceleration. It only makes sense in my mind for a period of time mathematically, then it just, it just boils down to the, the moral value of where that person lies. And I try not to interrupt that. So when I have a client, they come to say, I don't say, I don't care about what you're talking about in, in, in 10 X world and making more money. I just want to be debt free. Leave me alone. I just want to be debt free. And I'm with those people. I'm just like, okay, cool. Well, here's the fastest mathematical way to, to do that. Um, and, but here's your cost to also do that. So I always show the, I try to show the options. Um, but I really like the way you're you're doing this because I haven't used this angle uh, just yet. So I appreciate you sharing that. So we're losing three and a half percent when we do this, w whatever, so whatever, far. whatever method we're using sure. To, sure. to pay down yeah. debt. So, you know, when, when you say somebody comes to you and says they're looking at, you know, this particular situation, this is the formula. So I hope I'm not getting too deep here because I'm giving you some, this is kind of 201 stuff. No, but, this, is, this is really good. I'm learning a lot and this is going to help me get better. So I appreciate it. So the question is for every dollar you're deploying, then it's going down and let's take the person that you just mentioned that says, yeah, I don't care though. I want to be debt free. Okay. The question is what way is going to get you the, they're the quickest. So let's say that you do want to be completely debt free. You do want to completely pay off the house and AKA create a firewall, right? We talked about that, mm -hmm. create a firewall. The question is which way is going to get you there the quickest. If every dollar you're putting in is actually costing you three and a half percent. How can that possibly be the fastest way to, you know, pay that off and become debt free? Right. So the question is, is there other ways that are going to be faster? Can you, can you find an opportunity that is going to provide you with better than a negative three and a half percent return mm, all day. Maybe, maybe, 
I mean, right. you got to you got to factor in. Once again, we're using inflation there. So if you say, yeah, I mean, I could go get a, a bond and do two percent. Yeah, but two percent minus the six percent mm. is minus four percent. Gotcha. Right. Yep. So we got to compare apples to apples. I'm giving you a real balanced perspective here. But if you're able to get, let's say you got five percent, well, you're losing one percent. It's still better, but it's still not good. Correct. So the question is, can you do better than that? Absolutely. There's lots of ways you can do better than that. So the trick is it's things like this that we have been taught are what we're supposed to do first. And we spend so much time and energy pouring our assets, pouring our hard earned dollars into things that don't make us any money. And you say, yeah, but Joe, every time I pay down the do the, the, the mortgage, it makes me safer. Right. That's the, the theory. All right. Say for how? Yeah. That's my question. Okay. Here's the reality. Let's go back to the great depression. I'm a, I'm gonna dig deep for you. Let's go back to the great depression. Cause that's where this came from. What happened in the great depression? You know, we've all heard about, um, you know, everybody hunkering down and we got to follow what grandma says and what grandpa says and, uh, and, you know, put the money underneath the mattress and, uh, we need to, you know, pay down the debts as quickly as possible. The rules have changed. When the Great Depression happened, people lost their houses. But do you know why? No, why? The regulation was different. There was no regulation. Mm. The banks got in trouble and they literally called all the notes. Right, without they said, notice. Yeah. Okay. No notice, no nothing. Just, hey, you know what? You still owe us money. We're upside down. We're calling this note. They can't do that now. You know, back then it was like a, a handshake and a wink. Mm. <laughs> The rules are different. And so if we continue to play the rules from 1935, we're going to miss out on what the rules say we do now. It's like playing checkers when we should be playing chess. Wow. We got to understand the rules of the right game. Now think about that for a second, because if you're playing checkers and chess, something's interesting. The board looks identical. Now you're sitting there going, you can't do that. How in the world are you making your stuff move three foot, three steps forward and one over? You can't do that. We got to take one step at a time. I'm using a different piece playing by the rules that we have. What are you doing? You see, you've got to learn the rules. We got to understand what's going on. So what is our opportunity to offset that? Where can we go? Yeah, let's now, get into that. <laughs> when you look at opportunities, you say, okay, there's two types of opportunities. Like, well, let's take investments first. I like to draw a line and above that line, it's public investments. And below that line, it's non-public investments. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Anytime you get into above the line investments, then you are making considerably less money than non-public investments. Okay. Example, public investments, public investments would be a stock market. Gotcha. Public investments would be crypto. Public investments would be, uh, a publicly traded REIT, real estate investment trust. So you're basically what you're doing is you are buying into a product or a business that is already established to the degree where they're just managing things. Now, if you're investing in the stock market, as an example, stocks go up and down, crypto goes up and down. The valuation of the underlined foundation doesn't change. One of the things I don't like about crypto personally is that it has no foundation. It's 100% emotion. I know yeah. there's guys that'll argue with me on that. Yeah, you yeah, know, here today, gone tomorrow. Today it's a meme, tomorrow it's forgotten. I, I totally yeah, like, I agree I, with that. There, there's no, it's not based on anything. So it, the only thing it's based on is supply and demand. It's just whatever the demand is. And so as long as people continue to jump in and continue to buy it and continue to be excited about it, there's demand. But the moment that shifts, it's gone. I mean, it can go away overnight. Correct. Government intervene. Totally. A hundred percent regulations, anything else. Mm -hmm. So what about the stock market? Listen, if you take a, a company like um, Apple, Microsoft, yeah. their stock, Google, their company doesn't change valuation day to day. It doesn't. They're the same company yesterday they were today. Right. But their stock in the public world goes up and down based on emotion. Now, 
There's ways to play that game, but I gotta be honest with you, most people are not educated enough to do it. And Agreed. the idea of buy and hold is a sucker's bet. So below the, in, below the line, what does that mean? Below the line investments are actual investments into the asset itself. Now, the, the lowest form of below the line investment would be investing in a business or product that you own, AKA your own business. Okay. So you want to take uh, some real world, real life examples. If you're making the thousand, fifteen hundred dollars of extra cash flow, then A, I would invest in yourself. You are going to provide you the greatest return possible on your money. If you're investing a thousand dollars in education, that's going to get you to a place to where you're going to make $50,000 this year and a hundred thousand dollars next year. Is that a good investment? Yeah, absolutely. Is that a better return than the negative 3.5% you're going to get in your home equity? Yeah. Is it better than the eight to 12% that you're getting quoted in your mutual fund? Yeah. You see, when you invest in yourself, then your money is in alignment and is in alignment with your purpose. And when your purpose is in alignment with God's purpose, that's what we call the, the, the perfect storm. That's when God can really get you to a place where he can help you excel because now you're in purpose. Now, let me give you an example of how this plays out at a little bit higher level. There's other investments that are non-public investments and you probably never heard of them because they are only offered to people that are uh, what, are re what are referred to as accredited investors. An accredited investor is somebody who makes, and I don't know the latest number, you can probably tell me this, Denzel, uh, it's $250,000, I believe, income uh, as an individual or three fifty dollars as a couple. Is that still correct? I believe that is still correct. And then there's like the or one or million. million dollar net worth. Yeah. Yep. So when you look at a million dollar net worth, then after you get over that, now you have all of these other opportunities. That's why I teach people to focus per first and foremost on increasing their income to a minimum of $250,000. So if you're at 40, 50, 60, 70, $80,000, no matter whether you're 40, 50, 60 years old, it doesn't matter. We're in a great time to generate revenue in ways that we never had before. So where you may have not earned a million dollars in your life, you can earn a million dollars in two, three years if you just put your head down and go. Now, I'm not saying you will. There's a lot of, a lot of things that happen there, but you can. There's example after example of that, including the man that I'm sitting here talking to. There's ways to make the money. You just have to be willing to look at it and see it. So I, I'm going to date myself a little bit because this is probably before, I don't know if you even remember this Denzel, but back in 2008, 2008, um, everything crashed because of the, the mortgage crisis and, and all the different things. And there were all of these Lehman went under, all the different ones went under and they were worried that Goldman Sachs was about to go under and they were worried that Goldman Sachs was about to crater. And so the execs at Goldman Sachs went to Warren Buffett and they asked Warren Buffett to invest $5 billion into Goldman Sachs because they knew that if Warren Buffett invested in Goldman Sachs, then all of the other people would come and invest in Goldman Sachs as well. And the stock, the stock would, uh, would go ahead and, and boom again. So Warren Buffett said, okay, I'll invest $5 billion. And then they went out and he invested the $5 billion and they went out and said, Warren Buffett invested $5 billion. And everybody said, man, if Warren Buffett's investing, then they must be solid. We're looking for a place to put our money. Uh, that's gotta be a good place. Makes sense. Somebody they trust invested. Here's the problem. Warren Buffett did not invest in public stock. He invested in below the line stock. He bought a different grade of stock called a preferred stock. So here's what it meant. Warren Buffett invested $5 billion in preferred stock, meaning that he made 6% on his money before anybody who invested in public stock made anything. I'll say that again. <laughs> preferred. Mm -hmm. 
his investment was preferred over anybody else's. That was not widely touted in the news. So when you feel like your income is not really doing what you want it to do, when you feel like your investments are not growing the way that you want it to grow, it's because there's lots of different components to how money works that you have not been privy to. So you've got to focus on below the line. And I got to be honest with you, before you start deploying money in somebody else's business, you need to look in the mirror and say, what is God telling me to do in my life? What's the opportunity? Maybe you love your job. Awesome. Stay there, but find ways to deploy capital that you have more control of. Get into real estate. I can show you ways in real estate to, to deploy cash and, and to gather assets right now where people are hurting. They're struggling. They're losing their house. And you can be the person to come in and maybe you don't make them whole because honestly, it's not our job to jump in into their struggle. It's our job to continue to steward the resources properly because they're not ours, they're God's. And if we're not steward them wisely, then we're not handling things properly. Look at the, ta the, the parable of the talents. And so when you start looking at that, you say, okay, I can help people maybe not get in as bad a position as they would be otherwise. I can possibly save them from having to have a foreclosure on their credit rating while simultaneously putting myself in position to be able to gather assets and put myself in a better financial position to make the impact that God has asked me to make. You see, we've got to start thinking beyond just our lives. We've got to understand that we're just a small piece of the puzzle in a big, big puzzle. But if we're not functioning properly, then we're the missing link. We've got to step into our purpose. So you got to focus on below the line. And the best way to do that is to focus on you. Got it. Got that written down. So you, small business, getting to the, the goal really should get to 250,000 in income as, as fast as humanly possible. 250 and a million dollars. And then one mil. Now here's the kicker. How's net worth calculated? That's a great question. Please elaborate on that. Cause I don't think most people know. And even I might have a misconception of that. So net worth is your assets minus your liabilities. Okay. That's what I had in my mind. I just wanted to make sure. Right. Here's the, here's the, uh, the piece that most people don't know. Your house is not an asset. It's a liability. Well, it's just, it, it is a liability, but it's not an asset. It, it, you can't count your house in your net worth number. Mm, not even the equity. Nope. Because you're living in it. Got it. Be different if you weren't. If you, if it was a rental property, if it was a second house, if it was anything else other than your primary residence, but your primary residence does not count in your net worth equation. Got it. So when you're looking at, I want to be able to have opportunities in the below the line realm, and I need to be $1 million net worth. Well, if you're taking all of your money and you're packing it into your equity, not only are you losing three and a half percent in our example, but you're also not increasing your net worth. And so you're not getting opportunities that you might otherwise have. Wow. Even if you paid it off and if you're still Even if you paid it, it off. Still yep. can't count it. Yep. Wow. It's your personal residence. So when you start looking at little things like that, that's why you need to focus. Now, you know, $250,000 income may sound crazy to some people. Yeah, it sounded crazy to me two years ago. Right, it, it may sound crazy to you, but you know, one thing that I, I do like about Grant Cardone's messaging is basically, hey, listen, shoot for 10 times what you're doing right now. And even if you miss it, <laughs> If you're at 50,000 right now and you're shooting for 500,000 and you only get 250,000 and you failed and made $250,000. That's a, I love that model, <laughs> right? If you're shooting for, if you're shooting for 50,000 and you miss it, Houston, we have a problem. We're coming up on the top of the hour. Yeah. I know everybody's hung tight with us. They really have. I, I I'm seeing the comments. People are, are, you know, they're praising you. They're like, this guy's kingdom. We appreciate that perspective as well. Uh, I always try to make the faith very logical, like, okay, like let's, let's actually put our scriptures to use. 
<laughs> in the real world economy like, let's let's put it to use take it outside the four walls um let's let's have that discernment of what's being preached in the pulpit versus what actually is happening outside the four walls and and how do we you know make that connection uh work for us for the whole entire kingdom um so i really like your angle and this is the angle i i take as well um but now you've given it terminology public investments that's crypto that's stocks that's reits that's etfs that's uh, you know mutual funds non-public investments that's investing in yourself investing in a small business maybe going into business with someone in the in the family or, or a friend or a colleague uh, maybe you have an idea an invention something that can you know explode your income in, in a short period of time um you that's also affiliate marketing referral marketing little to no capital required um that's sales and marketing uh, because creating a uh, essentially a media company while you're on this journey of expanding income documenting your process it's a it's like double uh, opportunity of of income streams that can come your way and that's that's pretty much how i've been doing it is i've, I've had these ideas of things i want to do with myself and at the same time i'm documenting it and it, i'm turning it into media and that media goes out to these social platforms which 30 plus people are watching from all over the u.s in this very moment and they're hooked to the screen and i got them for the next hour two hours however long I, I i go for and then that translates into more conversations more attention money loves attention so the more attention we we, we put on money the more money can potentially come into our ecosystem for us to be trusted with by god to steward and manage those resources effectively so i i, I really like the the angle that you're you're going in now real estate is that a public investment or a non-public investment and could be either could be either okay good yeah that's kind of like where i was i got a little i was like this could be both right so in your mind on the non-public public would be a real estate investment trust right that would be an example of um me getting into real estate but a non-public what are some examples because i know you like the the real estate part and that is a component that has not been discuss too much on my channel yet which i'm also want to roll out eventually so sure so there's you know, i know we don't have a like lot of everything time. else there's layers layers got it right i mean it, it's it's less about the underlined opportunity and more about the structure of the investment so as an example there are public reits and there are non-public reits they're both reits they're both managed by, in many instances, the same company. Just public REITs pay five to eight percent generally. Non-public REITs pay generally eight to twelve percent. Wow. Same thing. Why? Why would they only allow these things to happen for non-public? Well, why would an accredited investor only be able to invest in that? Well, basically, all of these systems are set up to where. Um, um, I just saw Patricia's comment. Can we address that in a second? Um, Absolutely. So when you look at the non-public public, you have to understand that all of these, let me rephrase, not all, but the majority of just about, now I'm coming at you from a very different perspective. Uh, Denzel has already mentioned that sometimes I take a radical approach. And the reason why I take a radical approach is because I have no agenda. I don't care if you buy something. I don't care if you sell something. I don't care if I don't, I'm not selling any products. I can talk about insurance and I can tell you that, you know, in my experience with Denzel, the dude knows his stuff, but I don't have to tell you, you need to invest in insurance because I don't sell insurance. Now, if I tell you that it's a good opportunity, it's because it's a good opportunity. Now, the same thing happens in securities. I don't sell products. I don't sell securities. I'm not telling you where to invest or where not to invest. And so because of that, I can give you the truth. And the truth is most of what we've been taught is a sales pitch. It's about funneling people into the same messaging over and over and over again so they can gather assets. Like you mentioned earlier, what they like taught you. Like I mentioned you earlier. At, at so what happens is 
when you look at real estate as an example, why would some people be able to invest in one thing and some people not, not be able to invest in, other, in the other thing? Well, they have different parameters of how much reporting has to be done in a public versus a non-public investment. And because of that, there's less expenses associated with the non-public, which is why they're able to provide greater returns. Mm. But you have to be able to analyze it. But what they're saying is, we don't think you're smart enough to be able to protect yourself from yourself. Think about that. I gotta be honest, I don't want anybody telling me that I'm not smart enough. If I make a, a mistake, I make a mistake. Right. But I don't need probable, I need possible. And if they're putting me in a circumstance, I could walk down the numbers, and I do this in, in, uh, in my trainings. I walk down the numbers to say, this is the way we've been taught to retire. And I let people just like you say, are you going to get where you need to go in the time frame you need to be at? Are you receiving the actual rate of return that you're being quoted, or are you getting quoted an average rate of return? That's very different. Back to those are you, statistics yeah, being manipulated, right? Totally. And so when you look at real estate, you can have a private or a public REIT, a private REIT, or you can actually have your own investments. Now you could invest in other people's property. You can do what's called a joint venture. So one of the things that I have is a, a program for um, some of my people when they come in and I'm not pitching this, I'm just telling you that it's what I do. And the reason I tell you is because it's what other people do too. But when people come in, then I put them in a position to where I will actually joint venture deals with them. Now, it's a great deal for me. Why? Because everybody that's out there is out looking for properties and opportunities and they're bringing them in and I get to participate in those opportunities. But it's a great deal for them too, because it allows them to not have to do it on their own. Right. And that's a big fear, especially for me. I mean, totally. That's... And so, you know, what it allows them to do is actually get their feet wet, actually walk through some transactions. And then if they don't want a joint venture moving forward, they can go do it on their self. Right. But sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Some people say, hey, you know what? I'm really enjoying what I do and where I really make money. And so if I can just generate the deals and, and make things happen and, and know this is just moving forward, it's a security blanket that they like. I'm a volume now, guy, so I, I love that model. I just Totally, well, a guy like versus. you. <laughs> yeah, a guy like you, you've got plenty of things going on. You don't necessarily need to be full-time real estate business for the rest of your life. Right. You got lots of things going. But if you could add a layer. Firewall, right? Add additional <laughs> firewalls. It, it, it creates additional income streams. Mm -hmm. And we all need to have a minimum of seven income streams. Minimum. Agree. And what happens is too many times we go back to the quadrant and we say, okay, so which one of these types of income am I gonna focus on? Listen, at some point you may focus on all four of them. At some point you may be focusing on two of them at the same time. At some point you may be focusing on multiple. Don't get hung up in checkers. Play four dimensional, play chess. Understand there's lots of moving pieces. There's lots of things going on. Invest in yourself. If you feel overwhelmed, that's okay. Invest in yourself. I believe in you. Do you believe in you? You got this. Love it. This is, Does that this help? Yes, this has been fantastic. And what, I, what I'd like to do is wrap up with um, Patricia's comment. She says, as a believer, I just made a big financial error by using a large asset to pay off mortgage in full. Can you help? Question mark. Love to ask you a question. Question mark. Help. Okay. Uh, should I get a HELOC, another type of loan? Home is worth 1.6 million. I feel so stupid. Well, all right. So first of right all, way. yeah, you're, you're in a good place. Don't feel stupid. Uh, just breathe. Yeah. It's going to be okay. Frankly, you're in a good position. Are you in the most efficient position? No. Are you in a bad position? No. So don't, don't feel stressed out. You know, it, it comes down to what else do you have? And so, you know, if you said, Joe, I've got $1.6 million here and I, I don't have anything else. I've put everything that I have into this one asset. Well, that's probably not going to be optimal. However, if you said, Joe, should I get a, you said here, HELOC, uh, should I refinance? And I know, uh, Denzel, I know you talk a lot about this kind of stuff too, but um, for me, I like flexibility. I don't like having a lot of money tied up in an asset that I can't access. 
So let's go back to what we were talking about safety wise. We talked about the rules had changed. So there's two times that you're the safest. One, when you have the biggest mortgage possible in your house. And the second is when you have it completely paid off. So Patricia, you're not in a bad position. Don't stress. Are there opportunities? Yeah, lots. Denzel can help you. I'd be glad to answer some questions. It, depending on what your, your goals are and your motivation, I, I would be remiss to even try to give a whole lot of details right now. But I'll tell you this, if you're paying it down, the reason why banks have paid significant money to teach people to make extra payments, the reason why they focus so heavily on 15-year mortgages and encouraging you to pay down your mortgage as fast as possible is because every dollar that you put into your equity makes them safer. Let me explain. On average, it costs a bank about 20% of the value of a, of a house to foreclose, 20%. So if you have a mortgage greater than 20%, then they're underwater. What does that mean? It means that it would cost them money to actually foreclose on you. Do you think that makes them less or more likely to help you? Mm. Can you repeat that one more time? Because I think that flew over my head. If you owe more than 80%, okay, and it costs them 20% to foreclose. Foreclose. Let's say you owe 85% of the mortgage. So let's go back to our $100,000 house. You owe $85,000. Right. If they for let's say you miss a payment or two. If they start their foreclosure process, they're going to lose $5,000 if they foreclose on you. Got it. So the likelihood of them foreclosing on some are they going to be more likely to work with you to get you in in line? Yes. If you owe more than it's going to cost them, than if you owe less. Yeah, they're they're gonna want to work with that person. And the more that you have paid down, the less the better position they're gonna be in, okay. because it's typically eighty percent of what they sell the house for. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at their sale price, if you've ever gone out and bought a house and seen an REO, real estate owned by, by the bank, where they foreclosed on it, they're not always super quick to just negotiate the best deal they can possibly negotiate. They don't really care. They're getting what they can get, but they're really looking out for their investment, not to get anything more. So if you've paid your house down to, to $50,000, I would say, uh, the sweet spot is as much as you can can put yourself into. Uh, is it Menor? Oh, so, Mr. Uh, Mr. Ramos. Oh, okay. Um, you can avoid PMI in a, a few different ways. That's a that's a mortgage uh, conversation, but th there's other ways around PMI. Uh, but you know what it really comes down to is all of those expenses are just expenses. It's a numbers game, and so what can you? What's your opportunity with the with the money. If I got um, a, I'll, I'll give you an example. Let me come back to, to that in a second. Back to you, uh, Pearl, to, you, to your specific issue. I would look at two things. I would look at your opportunities out there. Um, Denzel, are they offering all-in-ones right now or are they locked up right now? As far as I'm concerned, I have about, I think I, I spoke to one to two clients that recently got their all in one loan. So I'm going to say that they're still writing them at the moment. Okay. So there's a, a loan called an all in one loan. It's effectively, and it, it, they don't bill it like this, but it's effectively a first lien HELOC. Okay. With, it gives you the ability to have check writing capabilities. The reason it's called an all in one, um, and you've probably heard this someplace else, but if you haven't I'll just give you a quick overview, it's called an all in one because you effectively use it like a checking account. And so when you borrow money from it, you can write a check and pay things and go from there. And there's a whole cash flow mechanism that we don't have time to get into. Denzel can definitely help you with that. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I've done content on it. So they, they're a little familiar with it. Mostly. Perfect. So if it were me, I would do something along that lines. Uh, right now, they, at least the last time I saw, I haven't uh, looked in the past a month or two. But last time I saw they would loan up to 80% on a personal residence. And so um, when I say loan, they effectively give you access to it without necessarily, you don't pay for it unless you're using it. Right. And so 
what, what happens is if you have 1.6 million paid off, then that would put you in position to uh, get one point minus 320 would be uh, 1.28, $1,280,000 of access so that you then have access to that cash to deploy into whatever opportunities you wanted. And while you're deploying that capital, you know exactly what your expense is, but you can simultaneously reduce that with your cash flow of any other income that's coming in personally. And you can you can have that direct deposited. If you have a, a, a typical um, W-2 type of a job, you could have that direct deposited in there and you could just keep it moving. You can write checks directly out of it. You can pay a lot of your bills with a credit card, get the points, um, which isn't gonna make you rich, but it may make you feel rich when you're taking vacations on points. Um, you know, it's, it's gonna put you in position where you might as well enjoy the lifestyle that you've earned. And so, you know, when you get into a position where you're able to get that money working, now you're able to recapture uh, lots of things. So that's what I would look at just off the top of my head on, uh, on your situation is ways to access the cash without necessarily having to pay for it if you're not able to deploy it. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. And then Patricia wrote, you know, sounds like a reverse mortgage. That's not it's not case. a reverse mortgage. Yeah. Not the case. Yeah. yeah. It's not a reverse mortgage. It's very, very different. Reverse mortgage would actually take your house um, effectively from you. You'd have to live in it and you'd have to be, I don't know how old you are, um, but you know, typically you'd have to be upper 60s to get into a reverse mortgage. And that is designed for people who are uh, needing to live off the house while having a, uh, a benefit in the house and continuing to stay there until they die. Um, and so they're effectively dwindling down their, um, their equity while continuing to live there. Um, and then if it gets to a place to where they run out of equity, then they are still able to continue living there because that's part of the, the equation. That's the reverse mortgage. Um, what this is, is this is an actual effective tool that is, a, that's a line of credit. And it just gives you a line of credit against the property, but it gives you access to it back and forth to where you can put money in, take money out. Interesting fact, um, I, I was told by one of the reps that, it was um, created in 1996, and since then they have had zero defaults. Now I'll tell you, the interest rate is higher than a, a traditional fixed mortgage. But once again, I've already shown you that just because it's a higher interest rate doesn't necessarily mean that it costs more. Because when you right. factor an opportunity cost and everything else, and the amount of money that you're losing with all the money getting tied up in the property, um, it catches up pretty quickly. Right. And, and so that out much higher, right? Exactly. So that's really the, the biggest difference there. 72. Perfect. Yeah. It, it just gives you access to it, Patricia. So it puts you in a position where if you don't have anything to use it for, no problem. It, you don't have to use it, but if you have access to it, let's say that uh, knock on wood, it'll never happen, but let's say a, an emergency came up. Let's say there was a, a medical bill that came up. Let's say that there was something that, that came into play. Well, it gives you access to that cash where if you wait until it's just like asset protection, asset protection is critical, but most people don't think about it until they're already in a jam. And by then it's too late. You can't change your structure. Yeah. And so it's the same way with a loan The the bank is willing to give you the loan when they're willing to give it to you. But if they, if you get to a place to where you need it, they're likely not going to.